author of several children's books including Indi Alphabet and How Many Lines in a Limerick, Shobha Tharoor Srinivasan is currently a professional voiceover artist. Her eloquent and warm voice has given life to documentaries, travelogues, children's audiobooks and stage productions. A former banking professional who moonlights as a writer, Lakshmi Iyer is the author of Why Is My Hair Curly? Khairu Nisa A is a children's fiction writer, speaker, academic and a columnist who created the comic book character Butterfingers. Rupa Pai is a children's author with over three decades of experience in publishing. She is also a well-known computer engineer and journalist from Karnataka. Lakshmi Nataraj is a veteran writer of children's stories from Tamil Nadu. Today, they are in conversation with senior journalist and author Kaveri Bamzai to speak on the topic, No Child's Play, Globalizing South Indian Tales for Children. Hello and welcome to yet another session of the Dakshin Lit Fest. I have with me a full house, five wonderful novelists. Rupa, may I start with you? And, yes. uh, you know, the, the subject today is uh, No Child's Play, Globalizing South Indian Tales for Children. But it's not just South Indian, is it? It's also just getting the stories, the Indian stories to tell our children. Because for so long, we've grown up on the idea of Enid Blyton and maybe when we were slightly older, P.G. Woodhouse and, uh, you know, uh, Agatha Christie. And that really has been our world. So it's just the idea of finding those and there's so many of course but telling our own stories that's the biggest uh, 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 accomplishment I think that all of you um, uh, have, have done have made uh, so talk a little about that struggle yeah thanks Kaveri uh, so yeah actually when I saw the topic also that was the first thing that came to my mind I said we have just begun to tell Indian stories so saying South Indian stories is too niche within that we just happen to be South Indian writers who are telling Indian stories, I think. And if, right. we are, if we are setting them in places and ethoses that we know well, that's just because of who we are. But uh, really, it's to get the Indian stories out. And I, like you said, not, not 30 years, but at least 25, 26 I've been writing for children. And uh, yeah, so it's, it's been, I have seen the whole, actually I've been part of the whole uh, growth and development and evolution of Indian children's literature. Because when I first started out, I was with Target magazine, which was a real thing. You know, it was the best children's magazine as far as I know that came out of India. Absolutely. And what made it really special for me as a 13 year old, 14 year old, I came across it late in life. But what made it really special was it was telling stories of children like me. Because like you said, I personally had grown up on this really steady and wonderful, I must say, diet of Enid Blyton. Uh, there was Amartya Katha as well. But Amartya Kathar didn't speak about children like me. Mm -hmm. So uh, it, it was always Enid Blyton. And then their lives were so different. Parents never were in the picture. They were always going off by themselves. And my life was just not just full of parents, but also uncles and aunts and random grandparents. And, you know, there were just so many people. So they just, my stories weren't being told. But when, and I sort of grew up actually feeling that somehow maybe my childhood is not as cool as, other, as British child, as a British child's childhood. Yeah. Yeah, it was a real pity, and that my food definitely wasn't as tasty as whatever you know, ham all and the, tongue out of all the scones and the yeah, ham scones and, 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 and sandwiches, yeah, gingerbread, yes. and, and 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 really. And when I went later, went and lived in England for a while, and I thought all that food was just so unappetizing. We missed Indian food so much, so yeah, so a little skewed in that sense. But Target magazine was the first magazine, and Children's World before that that wrote, that had writers writing about Indian children in India, and they all seem to be having a lot of fun. So that sort of flipped the switch in my head. And I said, hey, so actually my childhood is not that bad. It's just that I've not been looking at it the right way. Nobody, I mean, had to be schooled to, to know, to realize that I was having a great childhood in a sense, you know, because it was so one-sided the what was being aimed at me. And since then, yeah, Target was one of the pioneers. I started reading Target at 13. I made it my life's mission to have a job at Target. It was my dream job. And I went and got it, worked there for a while, learned a lot about how to write for children, what to write. And then since then, since then it actually began. This whole, uh, you know, Indian kid lit really began to boom only about 10, 12 years ago when my first series of books, Tara Nauts, the fantasy adventure series came out, which went on to become the first actually Indian fantasy series in English. 
uh, so that, and since then I can say that in the last, it was a struggle before that. And since the la in the last 12 years, we've had so many wonderful stories and wonderful writers coming into the children's, uh, Indian children's literature space. It's, it, we actually, there's a, there's a wonderful variety of books available on all, not just South, in, not just about South India, but about North and West and East and fantasy and, you know, everything is covered. But I, as Kairun sir will agree with me, uh, it's still a struggle to get the books, the information about those books out. Even within India, it's difficult. Uh, yeah. That's, yeah. That's Shobha, I'd like to bring you in. You've had such a diverse, uh, um, um, you know, upbringing and uh, also, you know, your, your life has been lived all over the world. And uh, everywhere, I think people like to tell their own stories in their own language. Uh, in India, uh, you know, because we have so many languages and of course, because of our heritage, uh, mm -hmm. we've had this problem of, you know, not being confident about telling our own stories as uh, Rupa also said so well. So mm -hmm. what do you think uh, uh, need, needs to happen to make this genre come alive even more? It's, it's there, it's already there. But you mean in other languages or you mean the children's no, writing world? In children's writing. Uh, right. You know, uh, how does one go, uh, uh, how does one uh, convince the child mm -hmm. that, you know, uh, Harry Potter is cool, but then so is, you know, what uh, Rupa exactly. writes or what you write. So yeah. how do you do that? Well, to be honest, I think, you know, as, as, as Rupa said, she, she talked about uh, Enid Blyton's and things like, you know, scones and, and treacle and Christmas pudding that we didn't know anything about. But the reality is the, the appeal of adventure, of mystery, of larger than life heroes, that is, that is universal. That's quintessential. That's to every child there is an appeal. And so our mythology, I noticed there's a lot of resurgence of, of the Indian mythology now, yes. uh, even available in, in America. In fact, I looked up Rupa because I'm actually not very familiar with all our Indian writers. I've met Kyra, I mean, I've, I know Kairu's work a little bit, and uh, I looked up Rupa and realized that she'd written a book called Gita for Children. Now, I was remembering an American, Indian American writer who'd written a book called Finding Om in America. Yeah. What's interesting is, as I said, there's, there really is no real global divide because of the internet, because of the access to books on the World Wide Web, to audiobooks as well. So um, what's happening is, you know, the idea of a hero, mythology, as I said, resonates with children because you have larger than life characters who have this incredible ability to do wonderful things. So we're finding a lot of books like uh, children's versions of the Ramayana, of the Mahabharata, of lessons from the, uh, from the Gita. In my own case, I'm a professional voice talent as well. And during lockdown, one of my little lockdown efforts, and, you know, I did it in my my casual clothes at home from a home studio in California. But what was interesting is I was reading stories that I wrote in shorter forms so that I, you know, I would read, read up the, the Jataka tales or Panchatantra or Tenali Raman, and then I condensed them into short stories that were easier and a more sort of modern retelling and read them aloud. And what was incredible is I sort of set up a YouTube channel just to do this because it was easier to record using the YouTube software and then just put it out rather than have to edit. And, and you know, I couldn't spend that much time. So I want the main job was to to share our wonderful cultural heritage with children all over the world. And I recorded every single day one story for 70 days. Oh, and wow. and um, it was interesting. I mean, I'm, this is not to sort of show off about the voice thing, but mm -hmm. the fact is people stuck at home are so excited about stories. And the Tenali Raman stories, for instance, I had 600 people listening in mm -hmm. at some point. And I went from, you know, when I started, I think I put in two or three of my audio books that I'd recorded on my website. And then I started doing these recordings. I went from about 60, 60 subscriptions to about 13, 1,350 people at the time. Wow. Because I would, I would record it and then tweet it saying, well, tomorrow I'll be back tomorrow with another story and do these lovely stories. So, you know, the appeal of our stories uh, and, and even the, the incredible, um, what do you call it? The in incredible similarity 
between our um, Panchatantra heritage and even the Aesop stories that people have read, or yeah. other mythology, you know, right. even Hamilton's mythology I grew up reading, is, is, you know, it's all similar stories and it appeals to children. So my whole, no, and then of course the idea of diversity and universality is being celebrated all over the world, Kaveri. Uh, you know, you'll know that I'm sure Lakshmi will join in and, and say that as well. Uh, yeah. Every There's a mandate almost in the publishing Absolutely. industry in the West to bring in stories that not just reflect the children who are reading the stories, in other words, not just having Indian kids in the story, but also diverse authors, diverse points of view, talking about disability. Today is International Disability Day. Yeah. Uh, and I worked 20 years. I mean, I come from a different background as well. I worked with people with disabilities for over 20 years before I decided when my children left home and went off to college to be both a professional uh, voice talent and do the writing uh, of children's books. And again, it's the impetus was to share, share our stories with our children, uh, ch stories that they may not be familiar with. So there was always that little pedantic impetus to, to yeah. want to share a little bit of what I feel we should share. So Raja Ravi Varma is because, you know, you read stories. Uh, again, Lakshmi, if you, uh, you have children, don't you, Lakshmi? Uh, I think Absolutely. You, that's right. So I was going to say there's, um, you know, we had these series in America of all the Western canon artists. And everybody was buying them and sharing them with their children. And I used to every time buy I mean, the books are fabulous because they're little kid books, very little text. And it's all reproduced pictures of, you know, Picasso and Monet and Van Gogh, etc. And I thought, hey, you know, we we could talk about Raja Ravi Varma and we can talk about, you know, Yamini Roy and, and even our contemporary artists uh, and share that with children. So there's a lot within our own cultural treasure trove to share. Lakshmi, uh, did you have the same uh, experience as uh, Shobha did uh, in terms of, uh, uh, you know, the Indian stories reaching out to more than just the Indian audience? Absolutely. So um, my, my route to becoming an author has been a little unconventional in the sense I don't have a literary background. Um, I, I mean, I, I was a good Indian girl did all math and science and everything. <laughs> so, um, so I've been a voracious reader all my life. Um, so, and like, so I was nodding my head when Rupa and Shobha were saying, you know, that steady diet of Enid Blyton. I have like the whole series behind me. Oh, wow. um, so, <laughs> so, but the thing is, um, because I came to writing in a very unconventional fashion and uh, the opportunity to write a children's book kind of presented itself. I didn't go looking for it. How, so how did, did it, Lakshmi? Uh, how so did I, I, I write a personal blog. Uh, my, uh, uh, so to speak, speciality is narrative nonfiction. Um, I share a lot of my life online. Um, uh, again, I have a very unconventional story in the sense that my husband and I, we adopted twins um, um, when they were about 10 months old. They are white children. And then five years later, we had a surprise baby. So now I'm raising three daughters in America. So, and the thing is, um, uh, Vidhi Bhargava, who's the, uh, the, who leads the children's imprint of Westland, she reads my blog and now, uh, or read my blog at some point, And she reached out saying, hey, would you be interested in writing children's fiction? And I'm like, I don't write fiction. I, children's fiction is very hard to do. So, so, and then, you know, we went back and forth. And then um, I realized this was literally a golden ticket. Um, and if I didn't even give it a shot, you know, and it's not, it's not the right thing. So then that kind of put me in that unique space where I could sit and think through what was it, what kind of story was it that I wanted to say? And like I said, I'm raising, you know, children across the racial borders. I'm, I'm raising Fantastic. children in a, in a land that I didn't grow up in. And I'm privy to what children are fed at school in terms of literature. So, and the canon and the classics, they're all, again, um, mainstream. Most protagonists are white. Those stories are either set in America or, you know, at, elsewhere in the white world. Um, and we do have this push, like Shobha is saying, about diversity, but it's a one-off event. Like every year, the school has like a multicultural day or a heritage day, and we talk about um, India. And then the plurality of India is missing. Hmm. It's mostly because, again, it, it, it reflects the makeup of the population that lives in your specific town. Right. So we have a lot more samosas and jalebis than, you know, jangris well, and mixture. True. That is true. So, and, and the thing is, and that's the thing, again, like I mama and papa are far more... It. I hope that changes with Kamala Harris. Chittis <laughs> <laughs> and Chittis, you know, are, 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 are due their share now. 
Um, but com coming back to it, so when I was given the opportunity to write, so I wanted to say, I wanted to talk about the things that we don't normally talk. So, and most, um, so in, in my quest to build my children's library, and, and I would go searching for uh, either books by Indian authors or books set in India. And one thing again that I felt was a lack was that there was a, a, a subtle whitewashing, there was a subtle mainstreaming. Um, while the, these stories were set in India, they still kind of um, aim to capture India as this vibrant, chaotic um, place but there would always be these stereotypes of poverty. Mm. The stories, like if there are backstories, there would be one of pain. Um, I would rarely come across stories that captured Indian joy. Like just because you live in 800 square feet of space with, you know, crammed full of uncles, aunts and parties and tatas doesn't mean your life is joyless or it doesn't equate to living in a 4,000 square foot mansion as a nuclear family. Somehow, as, I don't know, as parents, as um, society, we have come to equate space and material things with joy. And I, I felt like that essence of joy was missing. So what I wanted to do with my book, and I don't know if I did it, but um, the thing is I wanted to capture, you know, everyday regular middle-class Indian um, ethos that I grew up with, but give it no um, backstory, no assumption of pain or poverty or, or of struggle. This is a middle-class family uh, with both parents working. And again, uh, the, the other stereotype I've seen in children's books is the father always works, the mother is always at home. Right. Uh, or, you know, there's a lot of food. If there's talk about food, it's always the mom who's doing the cooking. Yeah. So this book is a reflection of me as a working parent and as a mother who has a struggle and who is, you know, willing to unashamedly share those struggles. So the book has the mom mad all the time. She is this grumpy female who... Uh, yells at a child and then you know immediately regrets it and then says sorry breaking stereotypes yeah. is one thing and the other thing I'm kind of piggybacking on what Shobha said was that I'm part of writer groups in um, because I write narrative nonfiction and I'm shopping around a memoir of the adoption um, so I'm part of these writing spaces where we have contemporary women writers and then now newly I'm introduced to kid kid fiction and what I'm seeing is like everything else, like whether it's politics or anything, there are echo chambers. So, so long as I'm in my group of brown women writers, I feel like there is like a, you know, explosion in kid, kids fiction featuring Indian protagonists or I, I shouldn't even say Indian, more like South Asian. But South Asian. when I go to the library or when I go to mm. like my child's school library, I'm not seeing that representation. So there is this, while, while books are getting churned, there is still gatekeeping at every level. There's like, you know, gatekeeping in terms of agenting, at least here in the US, you need to get past the agent, you need to get past the publisher meeting where you're pitching your idea. And like, if they already have like one Indian writer on their roster, mm -hmm. they, they've met their diversity criteria. <laughs> so what I'm saying is, is like, and then, then there are librarians, mm -hmm. whether it's your county library or whether it's your school librarian. So getting these books in the hands. So like when I, um, like my older children, they are white, but their names are Indian. So my children are Anjali, Meghna and Sahana. So there's this book called Always Anjali by, um, I think Shilpa yes. Shilpa, um, yeah. So yeah, so I got that book and my daughter was thrilled to find a book that reflected her struggles about not being able to get a nameplate with her name on it at the average mall store. Um, but these books are not found in libraries. I have to go and request them. Or so now what I've made a mission is to actually gift my school, my kid's school library with copies of books that I think all kids should read. And in just the past month, I've read to about 500 kids at my local school. Um, and most of the questions um, from kids, once they, you know, hear an excerpt, is that kids are not unwilling to read stories that don't feature protagonists like them. It's up yeah. to us adults to put these books in those little hands. And I think that's where the big disconnect is. So whether it's South Indian or Indian or South Asian or any cultural niche, I think the biggest problem we have as a community is in amplifying these voices and, you know, just diversity or people of color or this whole, you know, Black Lives Movement. All of this, this shouldn't be like this once and done. It's an ongoing. And I feel to, to get to that point, you need a seat at the table. You need to, your, you know, your publishing board needs to reflect the diversity that you want your imprint to have. So if you don't have a board that 
you know represents all parts of india if you're an indian publishing house or if you are like an international global publishing house and you don't have that re diversity reflected in the board making decisions it's going to be extremely hard to get those books out so because Absolutely. like again if there are 10 That's books coming right. out yeah. only two have the marketing muscle and push behind them so how are you going to get your books out if you don't have people with the power pushing those out karina sir i want to bring you in here and uh, take off from this point of really uh, pushing uh, our own stories how do we do that i think we have enough writers we have a surfeit of stories i mean at every street corner how do we get to uh, make sure that these are published or these are consumed in some way you don't even i don't even think that you necessarily just have to get published now there are other ways of telling stories uh, uh, as, as shobha told us so so you know so yeah. beautifully read them out on youtube i mean it's a fantastic idea so how do we do that uh, kairon yeah. you need to have a voice like shobha's to read it on youtube but <laughs> so all of us can't do it she's been doing a great job but what i would like to say is that that is the problem taking our stories across see all uh, uh, rupa lakshmi um, shobha they have all been writing different types of books my books are humor driven and i have uh, taken a lot of not lot of trouble it just happened because i personally don't uh, believe in distinctions um uh, religious distinctions social distinctions caste distinctions i was a professor in a college so for me every student was the same so when i started writing i i don't know instinctively that was how it came out that the place the locale is not there which city my butterfingers books are taking place in is never mentioned there is or the students uh, the children are they are a group of children and um, 13 year old amar he is his nickname is butterfingers he is uh, <laughs> he is one who takes uh, who is a walking disaster zone and takes his uh, friends with him on all these misadventures they get into misadventures they get out of them and it is they are sports based stories too so sports is something that i enjoy so what i did was to write uh, books which are humorous which are sports driven at least the first three novels are and except for the names being indian and except for the fact that maybe they reflect the kind of schools that are there in india because someone who is reading the books abroad uh, might and i have been told that that uh, this is not exactly how school is but it is nice to know how school works in india yeah mm -hmm. so that is exactly what i want that is even though my my books uh, may not tell you about india in that way in very specifically like um, what to say um, dealing with issues social issues economic issues caste issues these are all serious stuff but my books also tell you know uh, if you keep reading they also have some hidden messages the messages of camaraderie the messages of respect for older people the message of being together not letting another person down but mostly i want uh, children to laugh because they are so stressed out yeah. and i believe that they need to laugh like lakshmi said there must be joy in stories yeah. so that is the joy i'm trying to uh, evoke through my stories that they laugh and they de stress themselves they're totally stressed out so like uh, what you are saying you were asking me how can we take it across taking yeah. it across i think that is the publisher's job <laughs> they have to see that these books feel that these books will work there why did we read uh, in it blighton how did we grow up on in it blighton because those books were available here yeah so with and they are all writing in english so if it is um written in the in local languages in the regional language then good translations will make the difference how did marquez become so popular how did he i don't think we have had the kind of success i mean he has had a kind of success all over the world look at arabian nights i think that yeah. has gone everywhere right. if you look at it we have it, it it is something that we cannot really uh, there's no formula Hmm. to take something across 
it just happens but the quality of writing must be good and the stories told must be a different must uh, strike a chord in the readers and there must the publisher must have this belief that these books can do well they have a lot of lot to a uh, lot of uh, a great role to play and there's something else i want to tell you that is ak ramanujan he was yes. one who was very keen yes. that folk tales like he was oral folk tales should become uh, he, he wanted them to go all over the world indian folk tales so he's written that wonderful book folk tales from india he didn't see deliberately didn't say off india because he said saying off is limiting it because from india means there are so many more folk tales and he's taken from 22 languages translated them into english and you find that many of these folk tales um they are in different languages but because they are oral and now he's put it in writing many of these folk tales you find they are there in different regions because it's oral it's gone across word of mouth somebody travels from one place to another place then they mm-hmm. absorb that uh, the milieu of that area and that gets reflected so i think what you need like he was determined in the 80s and 90s there was an interest in the us um, about uh, folklore so he was responsible for stoking that interest so somebody like that someone committed somebody determined to say that we also tell good stories and these stories should be read it doesn't matter like shobha said it doesn't matter what uh, you are uh, you're saying because we want when we were small we read stories from china from russia those books that were very cheap we used to get really cheap books from russia russian russian books yeah i know masha <laughs> we don't know where masha misha all those and we we didn't matter that we didn't know anything we haven't seen snow we haven't seen the kind of life but we were learning through those books so that is what is necessary it's not that the, it, it is not that we have to be uh, faithful to um, uh, the place we are in or whatever that will come anyway but mm. i think what uh, what we should remember is that uh, globalization Uh, can happen very easily but there are some you know <laughs> you need some luck you need some oh, uh, also i think you need india as a as an idea to be trending yeah. then everything that comes out of india is very interesting yeah. Yeah. india is, is very interesting it's india in is the people are interested in india yeah. indians are all over the world right exactly. so they should take an interest in seeing that Indian they literature. do i think indian parents in the diaspora are very keen to find good indian stories and they there but there was no Absolutely. there weren't enough of them and now there are and now there is access as well so i think every time diaspora parents come to india they take back a bunch of a lot books. of books correct yeah. yeah. that's that's that may i bring you in here and uh, uh, you know add to this uh, discussion so what really are the elements of uh, a good story that india needs to tell the world in a way it's telling the indian story isn't it and i think i am the only person from a different profession here i was a teacher for 30 years okay and then during schooling days writing drama and everything after the school i started writing so basically my interest is children i'm very fond of children and uh, then initially i was writing for small children and uh, in champak and all that magazine and then i started writing novels and because i am a science teacher it was like a science fiction just like you people are saying it is exactly a total uh, what you call adventure book children will love it there are two characters indian characters everything will take place in one place of one novel will take place in kerala and one novel will take place in jamnagar and all that and because it's some different thing i give even a map where that river is there i mean the places are actual the story is this one and in that one of the boy is supposed to have a special power so it satisfied like these people writing uh, peter pan and all that one so but that special power i explain with science how he got that power so his story will have a different power so and uh, he got some power in the brain and as it moves his power will change so i wrote books like that uh, adventure of magic guy adventure of dancing goats adventure of and all that books 
six of ten hours, and I think they are very well sold because those days I just hand over the book to the publisher, that Vishu Vijay Publication. They have taken the sixth or the seventh edition. That means the book is selling. Obviously. Uh, then uh, I hope that, you I started a royalty writing. as well. Yes, sir. I hope you made some money as well. <laughs> no, no, no. That is, as I told you, know, we give away the story right. for once for all. But I think that is better than all other things. Because they give a total cash to you right in the beginning. And <laughs> 10 years back, the cash was really good. So after that, I started writing on stories uh, which are crime thrillers. Because I find crime is something which is which you can make it very interesting from the first page to the last page. And I have written so far six crime stories. <laughs> and then I have written latest one for younger children. So what somebody was telling about that pictures of uh, Raja Ravi Verma. So in that, whenever I write a story, there will be some something which the children will get out of that. So it one of the story, it is just ordinary school children. They don't have any special power. And they will go around and do something, but then they will find out some a secret or find out something. And then I take one more care when I write for children. There won't be anything which is hard. No murder, no curse words. And then it will be all like the, because I want the children to respect the police and the army. So in all that, it will be the police people who will be doing a great job. So that way. So finally coming, that's about me. And uh, and in that, as I told you, in one of the stories, which is like a thriller, the Lingeshwar, the mystery of the Lingeshwar temple and the Lothian chair. All these books are available in Amazon. And uh, from that cold reading or anything, I find people are free, people are reading. So that much is good. In that, I have mentioned a lot about our Hinduism, what is uh, this and all. I mean, when you're writing a story, you can always give some part of your culture and everything. It is possible, whether you write for bigger or anything, without being very, very open to that. I just wanted to ask you that you came to writing through teaching. So yeah. when you were teaching, uh, did you ever get uh, feedback from children that, uh, uh, that, you know, they were not reading the stories that they could have been reading about themselves? Uh, were they reading uh, about a world that was alien to oh, them? Uh, nothing like that. Because, you know, it's a long, actually, the student population has changed in a long, starting from the beginning. But my intention was to introduce them to read. Some of the right childhood, just like you are said, Enid Britain and all your crazy readers. I want the children to read. So what, though I was teaching maths and physics, in between I will tell them a bit of some story. And I will say, come on, you want this story? Go and read it. It's available in library. Okay. And fortunately, I was also holding the librarian so that those books were purchased. And even now, after so many years, my children are writing back to me. They are on WhatsApp. They say, teacher, only because of you, we got this habit of reading. So but, that was my main idea. Make them read the book. Rupa, may I just uh, come back to you here and talk about this idea of reading? Because we are now in this age of distraction. I mean, right. our children are exposed to so right. much and the smartphone tends to make you... Uh, pretty uh, dumb sometimes. So what do you do in such an environment to make sure that your words count, that your words uh, uh, are read? So one thing is, I think if you write a compelling story, right, if the story is able to, uh, children will read. I still have that very strong belief that however distracted they are by their devices, even the devices become a chore even for them after a while. They probably go back to it because there is nothing else to read. Or So I think a compellingly told story will be read. So there's no problem with that. And in fact, I think children, contrary to what is generally believed that children have stopped reading, I find more and more children are reading these days because their parents, at least in India, I'm talking of course about India, uh, since liberalization, that generation has grown up. They have a lot of disposable income. They understand the importance of reading for their children. They are surrounding their children with books. Earlier parents, like, you know, when I was growing up, or even my parents were particularly liberal, but most, a lot of other parents, even when I started writing for children about 25 years ago, would only buy like information-based books for their children. 
they have to get books out, yeah. encyclopedias, yeah. quiz books, you know, there had to be something, you, of, you know, because there was no money also yeah. for that, you oh. know, if you had, and then this education was a passport out of, you know, uh, many things. So yeah. they wanted, we wanted the kids to do, and particularly that we can bring to South India, particularly in South India. My <laughs> God, like <laughs> you had to read improving books all the time, right? So it was a, it was that was the challenge to get parents to buy the books. That's now true. parents are willing to buy the books if they only knew what books were avail- available. And their technology comes in very handy because Facebook <laughs> groups, uh, Instagram groups, this is where the, the information about new children's books in India is being disseminated very, very successfully. Still, like you said, it's still a, a little echo chamber. You know, it's still the same people talking and buying and just doesn't go outside that. And for that to happen, I think a lot of independent booksellers are doing a great job in India. They are taking these books to school because that is the only way. If we can include these school, these books as our books as part of the school curriculum in some way, get them into school libraries. And that's happening because of indie booksellers who, who some of them are just, especially there's one called Funky Rainbow in Bangalore. Oh, which is completely focused on getting on only Indian children's books. They don't even sell Indian books by adults, you know, Indian mm-hmm. books for adults, they, which, is, which is like a size, slightly death wish type of thing when you're in this business. But, but they still do it because they're so passionate about it. And slowly and steadily, the books are getting into schools. I think yeah. that's the way to do it. And technology is really, and COVID has been a blessing. In some ways, <laughs> yes. Yeah, yes. because we are now in, in this COVID time, I've been able to reach kids in so many different cities. People used to hesitate to do Zooms. I mean, there was no such concept at all, right? You would have to travel there to do the session. And while I enjoyed that very much as well, you know, <laughs> but mm-hmm. to think about it now, for to engage with kids for two hours, I would have to take three days out of my life. Yeah which now we can just, yeah, you know, so I'd good. like to add to what uh, Rupa is saying because um, the thought occurred to me. So alongside what she's saying, while the books are well written and everything, I'm just using this as an example because I had it. So this, uh, this is my the book that came out in July. I think illustrations make a big difference. Yeah. And especially I have uh, children, I have uh, neurotypical children and I have neurodiverse children. And uh, two of my children prefer graphic novels like anything with pictures they will read. Like um, they are not readers in the traditional sense, but each child has her favorite book by her nightstand. And more often than not, they are graphic novels. And my neurotypical child, she prefers like, you know, books with words, but even though she's only six, so pictures kind of make the book come alive. Um, So like when she's just reading about, you know, some things and she sees the picture, it kind of makes it all real for her. And um, I, there was another thought that I wanted to say when Kyrina, Kyrin starts uh, speaking. So I know you, you make your books kind of um, neutral and you're not specific about the place, uh, but kind of harking back to when I was reading, right? The fact that po- at 45, I'm still remembering the scones and the treacle and the uh, clotted cream speaks to the power of, you know, the little details that we include in our books. So I was very specific about including rava kesari and uppa and, you know, idli, chutney. So that is there in my books. (laughs) So I think like those niche things, right? We don't have to make it real cities and towns, but authenticity comes from including those real life details. And while not not all children can relate to them, um, they now have the internet. All they have to do is to search and like, you know, there's a plethora of, meanings and pictures and recipes and everything available. So I think um, reading is not the problem. It's just the the books have to get to I just wanted to add the business of uh, what Lakshmi said about the whole visual component. I write a lot of picture books. Now that's a genre that's very particular, supposedly to very young children. But I'll just show you this one. And it was published by the same publisher who did Always Anjali, and it's called Indie Alphabet, and it's like a coffee table size book, as you can see. So this was commissioned, it's essentially just a book of poetry where we take the alphabet and visit parts of India. But I wanted to elevate it to something where the book would last far beyond the picture book stage. So I mean, not to really necessarily show you, but look at the pictures, how big they are. So to read in a class. Yeah, wow. Beautiful. It's quite lovely. But 
it's beyond the picture book stage because at the bottom of every page, I've added a little fun fact about the place we visit. So I write four lines of poetry, say, about Kolkata, but at the bottom I talk about Howra Bridge and a cantilever bridge and give children who are reading it an opportunity to go out and do a little bit more research. So if it's read in school in a classroom, and this book has done, it's won a number of awards in America as well. I've read it in classrooms where there are Indian American children in American classrooms. As, as Rupa and others were saying, and Lakshmi were saying, the diaspora is there. We have Indian American children all over the world now. They all, they A, like Anjali, they want to feel like they are part of the story, but there are also their friends who've known them all. And it's exciting to those friends to know where this, their friends came from. So this book resonated because from a cultural diversity perspective, it's talking about another country, right. but it's beyond that because of the pictures, the visual elements. Now the pictures were done by an American lady and she's done a, reason, a good job. I don't want to say much about it, but I think in India, we could have done pictures slightly differently, perhaps. But, but it's this, not bad. It's very colorful. It's very eye-catching. It's colorful. It's vibrant. And it resonates with children. So, so you know, and what's interesting is here's a book published in America about India, whereas an Indian publisher got me to write, you know, as we talked about mythology and folk stories, one of the books that I did for them was called Native American Folk Tales. So they said, we want Indian kids to see, you know, stories from Native America that actually sound so much like some of our old mythology as well. So you know, what I'm saying is that the, the global divide is changing. Yeah, there's, um, such, a, there's uh, such an exchange happening, which is so... There wonderful. is an exchange happening. And despite, I, I mean, I completely agree with a lot of the things Lakshmi said, but I see things in a little bit more optimistically. I genuinely believe the gatekeepers are, we are getting a little bit more of a seat on the table. There are a number of Indian American owned publishing houses cropping up now in America. And these are, you know, what used to be called ABCDs maybe in the sense that these were Americans, born, Indian Americans born and raised in America, as opposed to somebody like Lakshmi or me or anyone who went there later in life. And, uh, and yet they want to, they want to bring in stories so that they, their children could have access to books that they didn't have when they were growing up. So those changes are happening everywhere. But I just, so she has to be a little more realistic. <laughs> yeah. well, no, and I see, but like, again, the story sounds amazing. Just like I know Cairo's stories are superb and I'd love to pick up Rupa's and Laksha's, but you know, mine is a different, different sort of genre. But you know, just to say this global thing, we've really got to say this. I think we need to get, I, I agree very much with what Cairo said. It's important on one level to bring in the location, but, it, but, but children all over the world have that need to read to learn about other cultures. If we lock ourselves in to just one specific kind of story, then again, we have the tendency to exclude all readers. And that's why, so for instance, I'm a poetry reader, okay, that just came out. The poetry reader has stories that talk about, uh, you know, Paneer maybe, but can also talk about trifle if it needs to. So when you're talking about poems, you can bring in things that bring in all cultures so that it's not just an Indian. I don't want to be just an Indian American writer. I want all children to want to read my book. And I mean that because I live in a, in a global world. I believe of my, I think of myself as a global citizen. I'm very proud of my Indian heritage. I'm very much an Indian in every sense of the way, but that doesn't mean that I'm only ex writing exclusively for Indian children. So I think that's a good thing too. I genuinely do. Yeah, Rupa, uh, you go and then I'll just ask Kairanisa and uh, uh, Lakshmi Natraj to step in. Yeah, yeah no, I was just taking off from where Shobha oh. was saying uh, and Kairanisa was saying. So my, or my series Tara Knots, uh, when I was thinking about where to set it, I had meant to set it in India. I had meant them to be three Indian kids going to different places or different like faraway tree and in Enid Blyton's faraway tree kind of worlds and solving problems there and coming back and solving real problems in India based on what they learned on those adventures. But, you know, my editor, Vatsala, called, she, the first thing she asked me was, what will these children call their mother? And that really just, I'm like, mm. so if I call them Amma, they'll become South Indian children. If they call, if they call them Ma, if they call them Ammi, Mummy, where, where do they? So that's why we decided, forget India, we will create an India-esque landscape. So there's a lot of, 
undercurrent, the subtext is entirely Indian. If you read it, you will notice all the similarities, but it's set in an entirely parallel fantasy universe called Mithya. And okay. I gave them maps and, you know, all that. So, uh, yes, I just wanted to bring that in. And the kids called their mother. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the, the kids never called their mother anything. <laughs> that was a clever way to do it. <laughs> I, I know, so, uh, uh, that's interesting. So what really needs to go into that uh, story then, which you're writing? And what is the kind of reaction you've had from non-Indians, say, who've read uh, your work? What have they, what have they felt? Oh, they have loved it. <laughs> in, the, in the US, there are some libraries which have my books. And someone told me it is there in New Zealand. Um, yes. So I don't know how it has gone, how my books have gone there, but I have got feedback from, at least from the US, that the children love the books. Because all said and done, they enjoy the humor and the fun yeah. and what oh, yeah. these books children. are really the funny. Play. Really funny. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. So that is what uh, I want. <laughs> so when they, when there is a lot of fun, when there is a lot of humor, when that is what drives the story, I think children like it. Because along with that, I mix adventure, and then the disasters, then you have the authority. They are in confrontation with authority, but there is never any disrespect. There's a kind of, uh, the principal uh, might be angry with them, but he loves them. And that I try to make it clear. Uh, and therefore, there is no enmity in my books. There is no evil, actually in my books. I do not know whether it's conscious because I grew up on Unops. He's my all time favorite. And his uh, villains, you know, are nothing. <laughs> so somehow that has rubbed off on me and um, I hardly have anything like evil and that kind of stuff. They do have these confrontations, they do have crises and they manage it and so on. But it is all, basically every page is humorous. I, I don't make an effort to do that because I love like Not humor. <laughs> but there's one more thing I just want to tell you that is uh, just one little bit that I want to add to what uh, Rupa said about reading. South Indians who want their children to read information, <laughs> books of books that make them better or make them more knowledgeable. So what I tell in schools when they ask why should our children read, when parents, when I have parents asking me that, I tell them that the best thing... Uh, I, can, I tell them it makes them better, all that stuff, but, but they're not convinced. So finally, I'll tell them what uh, Nicholas Carr said, that after research, it has been found that reading books, actual books, page, you know, the page, page by page by page, the linear uh, kind of reading actually does changes to your long-term memory. And that mm -hmm. makes you a much better uh, well-read and an individual who will be successful then they say yes <laughs> and you're able to retain yeah. information gk for ias exams <laughs> they train them from the uh, primary school i think for all this so then they say okay let my children read if that is what it's going to do to them so yeah, actually that is the tragedy you know of being a children's writer your market doesn't have the money power Exactly. Your doesn't have the money power yeah. or the mobility to go to stores and it, you they always have to go accompanied by a parent and the parent has to agree to spend that money. Parent decides what they must buy. What they must picture. buy. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Must Actually, I think that was true when I was little like you know I had to beg for money to I never really owned books. Libraries were my <laughs> only ways of getting books but now I find like you know parents of my generation have the income have the yes. willingness to buy all they want is for their children to ask for books like yes. I'll do anything if my kids said you no, know I but they will book. still they will still curate yeah they yeah. even if the children ask they will take them and if the child picks up like a comic or some tinkle really do you want that why don't you buy this one like, that's, so that's, that is true but then my child uh, if she wanted new yeah. kids yeah. sorry Dr. Uh, Natraj, can I just bring you in here and uh, ask, uh, uh, you know, when you write sci-fi in particular, uh, do you find that children are interested in it? Because we, I don't think we have such a well-developed sci-fi genre in India, do we? Yeah, but uh, that's why, I, you know, generally what these science things people do is it's something which uh, we are not uh, possibly connected as logical. Anything will happen. Uh, like if you take Harry Potter, anything will come from somewhere. Then 
Suppose a person has so much power, then why he has to wait for something? And that means there is a lack of logic that is what I think. But what I write as a one is, my idea is basically as I told you, children should be interested in science. So even when I was teaching science, I used to tell them what now happened some 20 years back about the laser surgery and everything I have told my children. So this, my idea of science is, I don't know how many, as I told you, I never sold the book and I don't know how it was sold. But then my idea is when they are reading, that there is a lot of science information. Like in one of the stories, there is a well and some yellow gas comes and the thing is sealed. Actually, the culprits have taken over that well to take some jewel. That's a story. But then these two boys, because they have a scientific tendency, they say, from the well, you cannot get the yellow color gas is a chlorine gas. So chlorine gas cannot come from the well. If it comes, then it should be marsh gas. And if it is a marsh gas, it will not have color. So that means there is something fishy here. So that, you know, Rupa, that Rupa, you'll that's be very wonderful. happy. Uh, it Rupa. is all self-improvement. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. Yes, yes. See, see, Lakshmi Lakshad, that's why your book sell. <laughs> Because it's no, see, I, it reminds me of the science. Uh, and it's wonderful. They both really are all over the this one, and uh, I mean uh, Malaysia and everywhere they go for exhibition. I exactly I'm going to be looking up these books <laughs> only because that cover has changed. Because I keep on buying the book and I see the cover change. <laughs> at least feel and hope that <laughs> we're all going out there to buy your books now. For sure. <laughs> yeah. And, and, and they, and they you know, seem very much know, like the uh, magic yeah. school bus. Yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, I love right. that series. Uh, absolutely. Last question to all of you: What is the one book that you read in your childhood which still speaks to you, which still um, uh, you know you remember and you go back to? Karinsa, would you like? It's a very difficult question. <laughs> Yeah. It's a really difficult question because you can't really take one book and hold it up. Yeah. But I would like to say that uh, Three Men in a Boat, which I read uh -huh. when I was in the Hilarious. sixth standard, I just loved it. <laughs> so that would be uh, me. Uh, I think my it was like life changing for me. Like it was a real game changer for me was To Kill a Mockingbird. I must have read it when I was 13 or something. Oh, it made such an impression, yeah. That's that strong. Lakshmi? Lakshmi Ayer? Uh, for me, yeah, for me um, not exactly childhood, but more like high school. I read this book called Roots by Alex Haley. And uh, um, it drove home the point of slavery and you know how people are being discriminated just for who they are. And that book has stayed with me lifelong. I mean, it was life changing, literally, for me. Shobha? Well, now that you ask us to think about our childhood, I. Uh... I read voraciously. I loved all kinds of fiction, uh, but I do still remember Gerald Durrell's My Family and Other Animals. I love, love, love. <laughs> and, you know, I even learned words that I didn't know, like you should absolutely. look up the vocabulary you words. To, absolutely. Yeah. But, and he's full of humor. He was absolutely delightful. It's a book that stayed with me. I have to confess, I don't have any of Kairunisa's uh, humor skills. My books are all far, far more. I'm into poetry, so I've been reading a lot of children's poetry. I love children's poetry. And my books very often are in verse. So I've learned, and my style of writing is very different from Gerald Darrell, but that's a book that I will always remember. And I'm definitely, I'm planning to get it for, you know, my grandchildren, for others to read at some point. And I'd like- One of my like favorites to... too. Yeah. Mine Good. also, mine also, yeah. That's true, Natraj, what about you? Uh, the same thing, in it written. Actually, those okay. stories, that adventure stories were actually my inspiration. My story is exactly like that. She had that bird Kiki there. <laughs> and uh, I have a uh, robo there which can do so many things. So the same thing. But uh, just the beginning of after that, I have read a book that uh, Hunchback of Notre Dame. That is one story. Actually, in our school, they got a habit whenever the gifts are given for education, they will give only story books. They will not give any other prize. So I read, maybe I was in eight or anything, I read this Hunchback of Notre Dame. 
Baxter story still stands me. Absolutely. That amount of sacrifice and what happens or something, I don't know. I still remember that story. Thank you so much, ladies. It was so wonderful to talk to all of you. And more power to you. May you write many, many, many more adventures and may many, many more children read them. Thank you so much, Such Karunisa. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Such a pleasure to meet you all. Yeah. Yeah. It's a nice yeah. evening yeah. to spend with all youngsters. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank, I, Thank you, Lakshmi. Thank you. Thank you very much for calling us young. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> special, special thanks for that. <laughs> Thank you.